a very good afternoon to everyone joining us. Apologies for the slightly late start, dealing with a few technical issues here, but I think we are all ready to go. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to join this Travel Trends webinar presented by RV Share. My name is Nick Ewan, I'm Director of Content at uh, travel website, The Point Sky, and I will be facilitating today's session. Have a great group of panelists that I am going to introduce you all to right now. Um, in just a second, I should say, before I do that, just a reminder, if you are uh, unfamiliar with Zoom or you have forgotten, uh, please direct your attention to the Q&A box. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions as we go through the session today. Uh, we're going to leave some time at the end to answer any questions that you may have as we look ahead to hopefully an exciting year in travel in 2023. Um, at this point, I want to bring my uh, panelists here on camera. I'm going to introduce each one of them. and I'll have them Come on, and then uh, we'll get rolling here. So first and foremost, we have John Gray, CEO of RV Share, of course, the first and largest peer-to-peer -peer RV uh, rental marketplace, serving more than 60,000 RV owners across the United States. So John, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we also have Toby O'Rourke, CEO and President of Campground of America, KOA, as you probably are more familiar with, a company with over 500 campgrounds across North America. So Toby, welcome. Uh, next, we have Alyssa Ravasio, CEO of HipCamp, a comprehensive online resource for discovering and booking unique outdoor uh, stays, including tent camping, RV parks, cabins, tree houses, and of course, glamping. Uh, and then we also finally uh, have Rob Blood, founder of Bluebird by Lark Hotels, which is a collection of reimagined boutique roadside lodges built not just as a destination, but also to encourage exploration along the way. So John, Toby, Alyssa, and Rob, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. So I'm going to allow each one of you to kind of do a brief introduction, uh, and I'm going to set the stage with a question. Um, looking back at 2022, we're going to talk a lot about 2023. Um, what was one surprising change that you saw in your consumer's behavior that you weren't necessarily expecting? So I'm going to go in order here. So John, let me start with you. Thanks, Nick. And thanks for doing this again this year. Good to have you back. Um, so I think the thing we learned about our customers this year is that they're very resilient. Um, we, we found, I think, a big question coming into 2022 is you had seen a huge increase in outdoor travel in 2020 and in 2021. Would that be something that stayed around in 2022? And then we had a couple of headwinds come at us in the form of um, high fuel prices and in the form of people just wanting to get back on airplanes and fly to Europe and fly to the Caribbean and fly to places that they've gone in the past. And in spite of all of those things, we had a huge year in, in outdoor travel once again. And, you know, at, at RV Share, we saw north of a 30% growth in, in bookings from revenue or in revenues from bookings and, you know, had an overall pretty strong year, given that it was a year where fuel prices were really high. And that is something that drove a, a really negative perception against the category of getting out on the road and, and going camping. But in, in practice, it didn't drive much of a, a change in behavior because really we looked at this and on average, the, the incremental trip only increased $35 because of the increase in fuel prices. So it really was one of these things that was big perception, low actual impact. Interesting. And Toby, from your perspective, what, what, did, what did you see in the world of camping? John mentioned it briefly, but how did you see things shift in 2022 um, with your consumer's behavior? Yeah, I, I build off what John said, and, and thank you for having me today. And I'll build off of that. Our business is 85% RV. And so likewise, we anticipated major impact of business from the gas price increase in the spring. We did not see that pan out. In terms of what we did see change is people changing maybe how they camp. They were camping closer to home, taking longer trips um, closer to home or one longer trip versus several shorter ones and just changing that maybe two trips instead of three, but they still wanted to camp. And I think that was what was so exciting to us is coming off, you know, arguably the best um, camping year that has ever been last year, you know, almost an anomaly because so many people are outdoors that a large percentage of those people want to keep camping and they were finding ways to keep camping even in spite of what was being thrown at them from a gas price perspective. We have seen, as gas prices came down, a direct correlation to people booking even more and doing more camping and saying they're going to camp more because gas is now coming down. So that's positive as well. 
Yeah, and you mentioned outdoors, of course, Alyssa, right in your wheelhouse. So what were some things that you noticed over the last year in terms of your consumer's behavior that maybe surprised you? Yeah, um, I would, you know, plus one, everything Toby and John shared. Um, something that we were curious about and were um, excited to see start to come to life is just the incredible societal transformation we've had around where we work. Um, and in particular, I think as we're all familiar, COVID for a lot of um workers, particularly in the U.S., has meant you can work from anywhere with a good Wi-Fi connection and a Zoom. Um, and so we've seen a big increase in people working from nature, uh, which is this cool uh, new trend we're excited about. So that for us looks like longer stays, weekday stays, which was not something we were seeing a lot of before. Our kind of core demographic is younger, primarily historically urban, getting away for the weekends. Um, and so that's been a pretty a pretty meaningful shift we're really excited about. All right, and Rob, finishing up with you, uh, especially that talked about gas prices, uh, LARC hotels focused on kind of that reimagined road trip. So what are some things that you noticed over this past uh, year? Yeah, it's a little bit of a different perspective, um, but similar in some ways, because we we most of our hotels are within a five hour radius of a major metropolitan area. So our, our traffic and our guests tend to be drive time. Um, so this year, we had an incredible like V v curve coming out of covid where it was our busiest year ever much like you guys but in, in a more traditional lodging setting we weren't expecting um some of the consumer behaviors to continue one of our our major expectations was that in hotels guests would be fully expecting full service housekeeping again um, and this year we found that even when we offered full service housekeeping most guests declined and have become more independent and appreciate privacy a bit more um, and the other thing that we weren't expecting was the astronomical rate growth that we experienced um, through this season. So it seems to me that um, there were fewer travelers still going to Europe because of high fuel prices and high airfare uh, prices and focused on more local regional travel, um, but were willing to spend more for it, which we did not expect. Yeah, and I think that's actually a great segue into kind of one of the first topics of conversation. I promise we're going to be positive, but we have to talk a little bit about some of the, the broader trends that we're seeing. So as we look ahead to 2023, kind of economic uncertainty is uh, top of mind for a number of travelers uh, really across the board. Um, but John, uh, according to the recent RV Travel Trends Survey, just about every single travel, literally 99% of the respondents say that they are very or even 100% likely to travel for leisure in 2023, um, in spite of some of this economic uncertainty. So as you look ahead to forecasting and some of the existing uh, activity that you've seen, are you seeing that reflected um, or are you seeing a little bit of a drag related to some of this economic uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, we're forecasting a really strong year in 2023 for a few reasons. One is, um, you know, and you saw this from the survey data, basically everybody says they're going to take a leisure trip next year. Um, that's not uncommon for us to see. That's not uncommon for us to see in a time of economic uncertainty. We saw the only time we've really seen that number pair back over time is in 2020, where people were concerned about getting outside their houses for health reasons. But you know, if you look over the last few recessions that have hit the travel industry, um, 2020, obviously a bit of a different one given the health concerns around it, but also then 2008, what you see is that when, when a recession comes or when there's economic instability, what people do is they travel, they just pare back the type of travel that they do. The, the amount of time between when they book and when they go reduces, shorter booking window. The trip is not on an airplane. It's in a car, an RV. It's going camping. It's, it's what we call drive-to trips. And they spend less money per trip, but still expect to take the same amounts, amount of trips. So that's what we're expecting to see next year. Um, all of those things bode really well for outdoor travel because outdoor travel for you know most of the people in this call is domestic. And you know this, this travel is largely domestic. And this travel is largely drive to, which is good for, for things that position you outdoors. To, I would also say, and this is a, a trend we've been talking about you know, for as long as we've been doing this panel, because it's a, it's a developing trend and one that's gonna be a tailwind for a long time. But what Alyssa said around you know, people being able to work from outside of the office is going to continue to be a tailwind in travel. We're starting to see that increase the number of trips per traveler. And we expect that to be a, a trend that continues over time. 
Yeah, and I think the the idea of camping and uh, as uh, kind of being resilient in the face of some of these economic headwinds, Toby, I think you can speak to that uh, directly um, and what you've seen either from previous economic downturns or what you're looking at as you look ahead to 2023 from KOA's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. We've obviously been through economic downturns before and what we've seen is camping comes through very well. And in our research we're doing about what we're facing in 2023, it, it's you know aligning with that very nicely. We're seeing that high likelihood to keep camping because people largely view camping as an affordable way to travel. We also see people, so we see people making those decisions about maybe I will cancel other types of trips, but I'm going to go camping because this is a way I can vacation with my family. And I also like to look a lot at people who already own equipment so that maybe they already own an RV we see a high percentage of those people saying they're going to use it even more versus other types of vacation when they're, you know, all things considered with the economy and things they may be worried about. So camping over time, over our 60 years of history has always been resilient. And I think we're all positioned very well as we're heading into this new economic climate. Yeah, and I think the outdoors is another thing, obviously, in 2020 and into 2021, um, the idea of getting out in fresh air and open spaces as opposed to, you know, traveling abroad, even in, in to areas that were open, um, we certainly saw a huge increase in that. So Alyssa, what are, as you look ahead to 2023, what are some things that you're noticing? Is there still that demand uh, for travelers to explore the outdoors, to enjoy um, everything that we have to offer here in uh, the, the great outdoors. Yeah, I mean, we're absolutely seeing that. I think, again, very similar to what others are sharing. I think there is a bit of a reversion to the trend um, that has happened over the last year where the spike that really happened in the back half of 2020 and the first half of 2021 did normalize. Um, but to be clear, it normalized to a place of still really healthy growth in, in our industry overall for outdoor travel. Um, and that's really exciting. I'm personally really excited for next year because I think this year it's been, there's been a little less pressure on the existing outdoor state infrastructure, which hopefully will actually bring more people back. Um, there was a recent su survey done that showed people thought it was three times harder to book a campsite last year um, than before COVID happened. And that resulted in up to 40% of people saying they are less likely to camp because it was just too hard to get a spot. And, and so they'll do something else next year instead. And so I'm hoping with 2022, the industry was you know able to scale up a bit and support more customers and create a better experience overall that will you know encourage those people getting outside again and again. Yeah, and of course, another aspect uh, when you think about the demand for camping or uh, individuals wanting to take some of those closer to home trips we're, of course, and again, I promise we're not going to be totally negative, but think about the summer travel headaches that we saw this past year, largely centered around airports and airlines. So, Rob, I'd love to have your thoughts as um, you mentioned that the, the your properties are all kind of drivable from these major metropolitan areas. As you look ahead to 2023, are you seeing that reflected where folks are saying, even if airlines are telling us that things are going to be better next summer. We're already looking ahead at making alternate arrangements because we don't even want to risk it. We are. So we're, we're seeing our, our booking pace is quite a bit ahead of even last year. And I think that the, just to your point, the travel cluster around airports and air travel this summer, because so many people were really trying to get out, get overseas and, and change their, change their view a little bit. Um, the frustration I believe has, um, Transla translated to better, faster booking for us. We're actually seeing an interesting trend with our booking window. It's expanding rather than contracting. Um, and so people are booking their peak travel now uh, rather than in a shorter window over the last couple of years, uh, which I love. You know, it's great to be able to get a good book of uh, business well ahead of season and then fill in the pieces. So I do think, I do think that there will be a lot of domestic regional travel um, continuing this year, for sure. And I, I'm curious to know, um, uh, Alyssa, I'll come to you on this. If you do foresee um, any other significant shifts coming down the pike for consumer behavior in terms of what they're going to be looking for. So we've talked, obviously, about outdoor travel. Um, Rob just mentioned the idea of longer booking windows. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, with a lot of the you know job uncertainty and people leaving jobs because they weren't giving them what they really needed. 
are you going to see uh, people saying, you know what, I am going to take a longer trip. I am going to invest more in myself. Um, are you seeing some of those things or do you foresee any other major changes in consumer behavior? Yeah, you know, one of our um, our board members, Mary Meeker, just said to me, she believes we are going through a societal shift that is the biggest transformation to our culture since World War II. And we are like smack dab in the middle of it. So I think there's a lot of things changing all at once, um, economically, culturally, um, and we're definitely expecting that change to continue. I think that's the one thing we can all agree is going to continue happening. So um, I would definitely point to longer stays, more flexible dates, um, working from travel, kind of more of a, you know, less, less distinction between those being totally separate modes for people to be in. Um, one just interesting trend we're noting this year in particular is a huge um, spike in interest in farms, which is really interesting to us. So if we think back to early pandemic days, I feel like everybody was baking bread and, you know, doing all these really nice at home activities. And I'm, I, I think we're seeing that translate a bit to a bit, a bit more interest in food tourism um, as a way to get outside and, and really kind of connect with the land. So that's a big trend we're excited about heading into next year. See, my in-laws are in Citrus down here in Florida, and I've, I've told them they've got to get on the tourism bandwagon. So this Absolutely. is going to be Sign up. Uh, but I think this is an interesting thing. And another uh, bit of data that came out of uh, the RV Shares trend report, John, is that a lot of travelers are still interested in relaxing and unwinding on vacation, 59%. But that's actually a decline from last year. So what are you thinking that is due to, and how do you see that impacting how travelers are going to look at booking their trips in 2023 and beyond? Well, I think the big thing that's driving it is the kinds of trips that people are taking are changing, and it's being driven by more flexible work. So to me, the, the most exciting insight from our trends report this year was this, this idea of hush trips, which we've heard talked about, but this is the first time I've seen really data around it. But what we found is that 56% of workers said that they are either very or extremely likely to take a trip where they're not going to take time off on the trip. They're basically going to, you know, explore where they are in the, the time around their workday. And that is the thing that I think is, is driving that number down of people who are traveling solely for the purpose of unwinding. But that is, again, going to increase the number of trips and, and focus those trips on value. I, I mean, I think it's amazing for the travel category as a long-term tailwind. It's also amazing just for the enrichment of people's lives. <laughs> they can do their job from where they want to be as opposed to, to one place in many cases. Obviously, that it doesn't work in all industries. But one of the things, and I, I said this at a, at a campground conference a, a few weeks ago, is as an industry for camping, this is a call to arms of having wonderful Wi-Fi that is capable of producing Zooms like, like we're on right now, because that is going to be a, a requirement of, of outdoor travel going forward. And, um, you know, and it also opens us to an entirely new demographic of, of people who probably didn't camp before who are going to start doing it. Yeah, just so to, Toby, just oh, to sorry, go ahead. That, I think, yeah, just, I think Wi-Fi is going from an amenity that people like sometimes want to have to a utility that is now, if you don't have it, that's, a really big deal. So we just launched a new integrated map that shows all of the mobile coverage because we are seeing a big trend in people doing tethering from their phones to create that Wi-Fi if it's not there um, and just expect this to be something that keeps building on. Starlink is also really opening up the landscape to people. We see lots of cool RVs and vans with Starlink satellites on the roof. Um, they just launched a new mobile product. So you can actually like get Wi-Fi while on the move, which is pretty wild. So again, lots of transformation occurring there. And not to make this a Starlight commercial, but it was a huge step forward this year in terms of rural Wi-Fi. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it really changed the game this year. Agreed. Yeah. So, so Toby, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about KOA and what that looks like in terms of meeting the needs of customers, tapping into some of these new demographics for folks who may not have considered uh, that opportunity to go to a campsite because of the disconnectedness. That's uh, obviously a plus for some, but could be a drawback in kind of this new age of hush trips and uh, remote working environments. So uh, take us through how you interpret or how you're looking at that. Well, you know, in terms of technology, you know, starting there, uh, I think it's a utility, absolutely. And that's the way we, we try to approach it at KOA. We require all of our KOAs to deliver 
Wi-Fi and but continuing to push them on. It's not just checking a box that we have Wi-Fi. It, it comes down to the quality of the Wi-Fi. And we've got, there's some really good providers that are emerging in the market that we're putting efforts behind to expand across our system best we can because they do have good models that can guarantee good quality Wi-Fi for campers and those that want to be connected. I think in our, our world, I call us front country camping. So to your point, some people don't want to be connected and that country camping, I'm not suggesting that, that you should be or need to be, or we should be exploring that. But for those that want to be connected and when it comes to a campground like KOA, that's a requirement. And, and so we're definitely digging in there. There's lots of, you know, camping is in the consideration set of travel. And I think when we started off talking about big changes this year, that started last year. And I, th I think that was backed up again this year and will continue that now people camping is part of that consideration set. It's not just I'm going to travel or I'm going to camp. It's I'm going to travel and camping is one of the ways that they're viewing travel. And in that regards, those amenities are very important that they would expect in any sort of travel vacation that they have, any sort of leisure trip and Wi-Fi is one of those. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the amenities because obviously that's something that we've seen a, a shift over the last few years as well. Of course, the in 2020, it was about no touch delivery, you know, uh, lack of on-site hotel options. Um, so, Rob, I, I I found it very interesting that some data that uh, that you all shared from Bluebird by Lark that the respondents, when you pulled your uh, email list, they said that they plan to spend more at on-site restaurants and on-site bars. So does that indicate that folks are now getting at a point where they're feeling much more comfortable at utilizing these amenities and they want that's where they want to spend their time as opposed to going out and engaging in off-property um, uh, outlets? I think there's a mix there. I, I do think that's definitely true. And I've experienced this in my own personal travel as well as with our, our hotels and resorts is that people, um, first of all, people always like to have immersive local experiences. Uh, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. That's that's like hands down our primary bent is getting people out and focused on experience they have in the local community, wherever it may be, whether it's hiking the mountain behind the hotel or having a great immersive uh, culinary experience in local restaurants. Um, I'm happy to see uh, from a from a business perspective that our guests are looking to focus a little bit more on, on property dining. Um, I don't think that will be at the detriment though of the other experiences around the community. So um, while, while our guests did say that, I think it was something like 90 something percent of them would be spending more money on on-property amenities. Um, I do believe that the focus from our perspective will still be on getting them out into the communities. Yeah, and obviously that's something that uh, an RV uh, can do, uh, can really help enable is, you know, not just serving as kind of a, a mobile accommodation, but also allow uh, folks to be mobile and to explore the community. So, um, John, can you uh, give us some insight? Uh, are folks still looking at RVs as much as they were with the return of air travel, with the opening of international borders? When we talked uh, last year on this webinar, you still had testing requirements to get back in the U.S., still had a lot of testing requirements to enter foreign uh, countries. So are you still seeing this idea of um, or the continued demand for RVs given some of this um, kind of reopening of the, the world? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think Toby just said that when, you know, camping is part of mainstream travel, and I would say camping is part of mainstream travel now, and that happened in 2020, it stayed in, in 2022. And, you know, people did have other options and they still continue to, to do outdoor travel. We're seeing people now start to expand the definition of outdoor travel. So, you know, they're getting RVs delivered. So these are people who probably would have never rented an RV and driven it somewhere, but they're happy to get it rented and delivered to somewhere where they can, you know, show up at a KOA and, you know, have a water slide nearby or show up at a hip camp and be, you know, in the middle of nowhere with just all the stars in the sky. Right. And that is the the level of breadth that is now available to to people. And, you know, you're so you're kind of starting to see the beginning of the maturation of outdoor travel as a mainstream category of travel. So not only is outdoor a category, but there's categories within outdoor. 
like, you know, Alyssa was talking about, you know, farms and kind of rural type travel. You're seeing people, you know, want to stay in an RV, maybe because it's pet friendly or because it has more bunks or something like that right next to Disney World. Or, you know, there, there's just so many different use cases. So those along with people wanting to use RVs for music festivals, for temporary housing, for, you know, use cases like that have really driven this industry into the mainstream. It's continued to grow off of what were some incredibly strong growth years in 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, you look at most businesses in travel and in accommodations, they're still referencing the, well, here's how we're doing compared to pre-pandemic levels. The, the outdoor travel space, the RV rental space is many times where it was pre-pandemic. And, you know, that's, a, I think, an important piece of context to remember when, when you're looking at where we are versus where we were a pretty short time ago. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you bring up uh, the idea of Orlando, because, of course, that has always been a popular destination. Um, but we've seen a huge spike, at least here at the Point Sky, in interest in traveling to Orlando. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the, the destination uh, landscape, specifically within kind of the U.S. and North America. Toby, let me start with you. What were some of those destinations, kind of underrated or under the radar destinations you saw in 2022 that really jumped out and do you see them continuing to be in demand or are there any ones that you have identified for 2023 as possible um, new hot spots from a KOA perspective? Well, I think the big story for us this year was that the cities rebounded. So in 2021, for sure 2020, but also 2021, we saw more remote locations you know, in our parks, our campgrounds around national parks and some of those uh, off the beaten path locations, we're having big years. But this year, Nashville, Orlando, Vegas, those are back, but bigger than they were even pre-pandemic. I think there is this desire for people to return to the cities. They wanna go back to the traditional tourism markets. They, they miss getting to New York City, they miss getting to Nashville. And we saw that play back in our business. So that, that was our big story. I think it'll normalize. We saw national park campgrounds down this year as visitation at national parks is, is down across the board as well. We saw cities way up. I think we're normalizing and it's a new bar that will be set. I don't think nothing's jumping out to me yet as a, you know, an under the radar location for next year. I think we're just going to start to normalize and be building off this year as our new base level of how travel looks domestically going forward. And Alyssa, what about you? Some destinations that maybe this past year surprised you or maybe from your own experience saying, well, yeah, this was a gem. It was about time someone discovered it. And what are you all looking at for some trends in um, travelers picking destinations with HipCamp in 2023? Yeah, and in terms of destinations overall, I would say we saw more of the same from, from where we were sitting in terms of you know, people love getting outside of cities and just staying for that shorter trip. And then they also love going on road trips. So actually over half of the travel on hip camp is people outside of the state where they live in the U.S. So they are on these longer road trips. They are visiting their national parks. Um, and so that led to definitely, you know, right now it's, you know, December. So it's, it's Texas, it's Florida. Um, we're seeing like very exciting growth in those markets. Um, and as we head into next year, one thing that we're we're thinking about a lot is just how do we use really cool data about nature? So, you know, stargazing, uh, eclipses, uh, migrations of butterflies um, to kind of help people discover more of these un undiscovered gems, to, to use your word. Um, and so we do have um, some strategies we're, we're putting into place there that, again, are really aimed to use data about nature to help people get excited about maybe less trodden uh, paths. Yeah, I think that, um, Rod, as we think about uh, the Bloomberg by Lark hotels, th they are not, you know, in these, you know, really well-trodden, you know, well-known uh, areas, Saratoga Springs, Cape Cod, um, you know, and some of the other ones in the, the Northeast. So would love to know what you're seeing from uh, this past year, but also looking ahead in terms of what destinations are kind of at top of mind. And we do have a question from the uh, the audience as to whether you're looking at any additional uh, properties in uh, 2023 or any additional locations for hotels? Sure. Um, I We saw a lot of the same things that Toby is describing, where um, early in the pandemic, our rural and more resort-focused hotels were booming and our city hotels were less popular. Uh, this last year, 
the, the, the level stayed high at our leisure properties, but city properties did rebound. Um, Bluebird is has, was sort of founded on the principle of the road trip and connecting the dots along the map and making the journey as important as the destination. And so we have eight in our portfolio right now, and all are sort of adjacent to great outdoor experiences. So one of the things we found from our loyal guests is that they're looking to take longer road trips. So uh, quickly outside the pandemic, it was two to four hours. This, this uh, most recent survey that we did showed that guests are looking to take road trips up to eight, eight to 10 hours. Um, and so for us, that means multi-stop itiner multi itineraries where we can help them create experiences between point A and point B. You know, the typical hotel is focused on um, creating experience with, with just within the neighborhood. Um, our focus with Bluebird is how can we help you get from Saratoga Springs to Hunter, New York, to Lake Placid and see everything along the way that's worth seeing. So I see that, uh, we talked, I talked a little bit about experience before, but immersive experience with your family, I see that as a continuing opportunity in all of our segments um, to grow. And the, for the panelist um, or the uh, audience, we do have a few new locations um, that we're looking at in coastal North Carolina, um, as well as uh, coastal California. So crossing fingers, those come together. Well, as you talk about experiences, obviously, you know, we talked about camping before being resilient in the times of economic crisis. I think there's also a perception that camping uh, equates to a rugged form of travel. Um, so John and then Toby, I'd love for you to weigh in um, as you, you see, uh, John, in the RV share report that the appeal of RVs and motorhomes uh, continues to rise up 9% uh, um, over the previous year, um, but then also similarly interest in clamping sites. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, uh, for those attendees, my wife is not on, but she would definitely be in this boat, uh, who aren't interested in the ruggedness of camping, but maybe want to experience the outdoors with more creature comforts. What are some of the things that you are seeing and that um, your respective uh, platforms offer in terms of amenities and uh, comforts for potential guests? Yeah, I mean, I think the the simple thing to say here is that camping and RVing are as rugged as you'd like them to be, right? They can be very rugged. It can be backcountry camping, like like Toby was explaining, where you know it, it's quite primitive and almost like a, a survival skill type of thing. There can be camping literally on Disney World's property, right? I mean, you, you know, there is that range of, of differences. There's a, you know, a, a brand new Margaritaville campground that's opened in Central Florida that has incredible amenities. I mean, it's just a, it's, there is a wide range of, of what's available just in the places where you can put the RV. Now, an RV is purpose built to be very comfortable as a place to stay, right? It has an air conditioner. It has your own kitchen in it. It has a bathroom, a shower, a comfortable bed. And those are the amenities where, you know, when compared to tent camping, position an RV in a, in a way that's comfortable for a lot of people who might not be comfortable with tent camping, but want to spend some time outside, want to be next to a national park, um, those types of things. Um, so I'd say those are the biggest amenities. They're simple ones, but they're pretty much available in almost every RV. But those are the ones that, that I think drive people to RV camping. Toby, just a quick follow-up. Are you seeing that increased interest in some of these amenities and the camping in style or glamping um, across the, the KOA portfolio? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think what's great about camping is everyone's a camper. There is a, a way to camp that will appeal to anybody. And that's where we've seen this emergence of glamping, per se. There's lots of ways people camp. People camp in cabins that are outfitted with kitchens and bathrooms. They're camping. Um, there's RVs that are nicer than my home, for sure. Um, <laughs> there's tree houses. There's yurts. There's a lot of variety of ways people are camping and getting access to the outdoors. I mean, at our outdoor resort, we own in at Terramore, we have, you know, very upscale um, outfitting in our tents that rival, you know, luxury hotels. The amenities people seek on our parks that are interested in that type of experience, you know, there is everything from activities for the family to enjoy to restaurants to massage tents right and all, all the range of that's available at at our outdoor resorts or at our campgrounds so glamping is very self defined. 
that the reality is people want to be outside. They find value in being outdoors and connecting with family and friends outdoors. And there is definitely a way to camp or way to be outdoors that will appeal to them. It can be very, very comfortable. And I think that's what why we've, we're seeing the popularity, why people are gravitating towards it and why people are saying they're going to keep camping headed into 2023. And Alyssa, I'd love to know from your perspective, what you've seen with your consumers behavior at hip camp. Are you seeing uh, that your traditional customer gravitates to just one type of, uh, of experience or are they testing the waters to see, maybe I would like glamping. Nope, that is a little too, maybe I do wanna go back to a little more rugged. Are you seeing a variety in kind of consumer behavior to test these different aspects of experiencing the outdoors? Yeah, it's a great question. And the data point surprised us. Um, we see incredible crossover between camping types. Um, they can stay in an RV one weekend, glamp the next and tent camp in a couple months. Um, that's actually the majority of our repeat users are doing different types of camping or what we call outdoor stays um, the second or third time, which is pretty interesting, I would say, to say the least. So I do think people love doing different things. We've also heard a lot about depending on who they're traveling with. Um, they want a different type of stay. So if it's with a broader family, let's go glamping, let's keep it easy. If this is my weekend away from the kids, I'd love to really get out there and do something a bit more um, rugged or, or private. So we're definitely seeing um, a big diversity there. And just to build on John and Toby's point, we are seeing outsized growth in our glamping and RV verticals. Um, and some of that's happening for really interesting reasons. Um, hip camps are often you know, larger properties with lots of different sites that people rent, um, sometimes uh, concurrently. And another interesting trend there has been um, company offsites and people bringing their company together, but outside. And actually to give RV Share a major shout out, we did um, one this year for our global teams, um, brought everyone together and people were worried about tent camping in Northern California where there was rain forecasted. Um, and RV Share brought in a ton of great RVs. And, and yes, Toby, a lot of them were nicer than my house too. I was like, this is incredible. I feel like a rock star in here. Um, and people love staying in them. And so I think you're seeing kind of this, you know, John, I actually think you said this during the panel last year that outdoors has officially gone mainstream, like we're here. And with that, people, I think, have gotten over this um, elitism or idea that you have to suffer for it to like be the right thing to do and are just doing what works for them. And I think it's a really a beautiful thing and a great thing, obviously, for everybody in the space. Yeah, and I think it's super interesting that you bring up the type of trip, um, family trip, couple trip, because Rob, I want to come to you. Uh, another interesting data point that you pulled out, and we actually do have an uh, audience question about this. Um, by emailing your, uh, uh, or by polling your email list, the majority of respondents were more interested in a couple-focused or adult-type experience in a hotel than family-focused. Um, and we do have a question about uh, data around those travelers who have young children. Are they open to doing longer road trips or are they looking to keep a little bit closer to, to their home? So would love, Rob, for you to speak in and then anyone else on the panel to weigh in on kind of the couple adult side of the coin versus the family travel side. I think, I think this is very interesting and I have two different thoughts. One, um, our primary respondents for that survey were traditional guests of Lark Hotels, which are upper upscale hotels that traditionally cater to couples. So it might be skewed a little bit, but I have a couple just sort of anecdotal thoughts. I have three young children and we road trip with them on a regular basis and um, it can be challenging, right? So we've been doing that a lot for the last couple of years. My wife and I just took our very first like couples focused trip in a long time. And it was like a cleansing experience for us. So I think one of the things that COVID did was it brought us all close together in our homes. We had our kids at our hips and coming out of that, we kept them at our hips and we kept traveling with them and we found ways to road trip with them. And, and honestly, part of the, the idea behind Bluebird was how do we take some of the pinch points or pressure points out of those trips when you get out of your car, or SUV, or if we were lucky, an RV and needed to like arrive and the parents needed to have a vacation, the kids needed to have a good time. So I think we did a lot of that. And I think part of the response that we saw is that we've done that, we wanna continue doing that, but we also need to tend to the other significant person in our lives and remember that we're where people 
outside of parents. Um, so I think that I think both things are going to continue to happen, and I imagine in the outdoor industry as well. But we fully intend to continue traveling with our three little ones, and we also intend to really focus on a few adult-only trips this year. And I think that's probably what our our guests are feeling as well. John, I'm curious to know um, from the RV share perspective, are you seeing um, th those kind of dual uh, pathways where interest in adult only trips, but then also families coming together um, to take advantage of RVs? And then I'll add in another question that just came into the, the Q&A. And for our attendees, if you haven't answered any questions, please feel free to drop them in. We're going to get to some of those in just a second. Um, are you seeing more, uh, continuing to see a lot of first time RVers or are these first time RVers from two years ago in 2020 that are now coming back as second, third, fourth times? So, so let me answer both those questions. First one is I, I've kind of started with the assumption in this business based on data and intuition that we're in the family travel business and that most of our trips are taking more than a couple of people, right? It's, it's typically a nuclear family with a couple of parents and a couple of kids, you know, and that's, that's usually who's taking trips on RV share. You know, when I go home and at night and tell my kids what I do for a living, I tell them I help people make memories, right? That's what we're doing. And, and that's what's exciting about this business. Um, so that is, so I look at it as from RV Share's perspective, we're mostly in larger groups. We're mostly in family travel. We have some, you know, we think of it as kind of a van life demographic that's one or two people traveling. That's a smaller segment of our business. It's less than 20%. It's there, it's less than 20%. Um, during COVID, kind of right when the pandemic started, we saw a very high percentage of new people to the RV category. About 75% of our bookings in, in 2020 and in 2021 were from first-time RV renters. That number has cut back to about two-thirds in 2022, and that's because more people are returning. People had a great time. We get about 95% five-star reviews on RV Share. So people who go on an RV trip with RV Share typically love it and they want to come back again. So we're starting to see those big cohorts that came in in 2020 and 2021 coming back in, in 2022. And Toby, I'd love to get your thoughts on the family perspective and then also the return users. Of course, here at the Point Sky, we love our loyalty program. So would love to get your insight into whether you're seeing an uptick in those return kind of frequent guests that are, you know, taking advantage of the fact that, you know, you have this wide variety of uh, campgrounds and different types of experiences, different types of amenities to meet the needs of, you know, a two-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a seven-year-old. That, that's what I like about our business. And when I was saying everyone's a camper, I, I think that KOA can appeal to every type of camper. And I've always enjoyed that. And as a marketer, it's been fun for me to try to appeal to all these different audiences. When I started at KOA almost 12 years ago, camping in general, based not just KOA, camping in general was very much a um, baby boomer activity. And we used to focus on the, the time at the time that 10,000 baby boomers retired every day. And but thus our business was, you know, destined for greatness. Over time, over this past decade, that has shifted dramatically younger to where the majority of people that camp now are millennials. And we have, you know, well over half of campers, you know, two thirds of campers are families. So that's just a shift that's happening in the industry. But we do see definitely based off seasonality in the fall, we start to see, well, fall business is huge, by the way, a lot of um, Halloween weekends for us, a lot of people bringing families to campgrounds in the fall. But once school does go back in session, if we do see that older demographic or those couples camping now that you know, their kids are back in school or their grandkids are in school, now they're focused on their travel. We, see, we definitely see that pick up in the fall and the winter. But there is definitely something to appeal to everyone. And, and the question on repeat business, I think you know, that's what I like about our system, but that's what's great about all of camping. There's always something new to discover. There's always some place new to explore. And I think that people that camp like that exploration aspect. When we were talking about trends earlier, one thing we're seeing peak in our data as we head into next year is people are ready for adventure. We've been home, we've been camping close to home, whether that's due to health reasons or economic factors, people are ready to get out and explore. And camping is a great solution for that because there's camping everywhere and there's lots of different ways to camp and places to camp. 
Yeah, and I think Alyssa, I'll come to you with kind of the the follow up from that. You know, I love the the story of how Hip Camp came to be and um, this idea of experience and adventure. Um, are you seeing that in terms of your customers' activity and what they're looking for and the types of things that they are engaging with, not just from this past year, but also looking ahead to, to 2023? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think doing what you get to do, what you get to experience, what you get to really have be part of that broader adventure um, is absolutely what drives a lot of the particularly like location decisions we see people make. So um, we're actually investing right now in some really cool data projects to build out really powerful um, data sets using machine learning that can really help people understand, oh my gosh, everybody loves like the surfing in this area um, and really making that an easier way to navigate all the options we have. We have hundreds of thousands of sites on HipCamp today. So that's a lot um, for your average person to just browse through. And um, again, we're definitely seeing activities and to Toby's point, like adventure um, really surfacing and something that's been missing for people for a long time. Um, I think it's going to drive this this whole space forward for years to come. Awesome. We have a, a question in the Q&A here, uh, Rob, for you that's along those same lines. You mentioned before the idea of not just uh, staying in your uh, the Bluebird uh, by Lark Hotels, but experiencing the different elements on the way between them. So are you looking at any kind of programming um, or special access to attractions on the routes near the hotels to help encourage folks to not just enjoy the amenities at the hotel, but engage with the local communities, immerse themselves in the, the culture as they are visiting some of your properties? Yes, so that's a great question. One of our major focuses for 2023 is building out multi-day itineraries and packages and programs for our guests to select on their own. Uh, one, of the, one of the important things to me is that Bluebird continues to be an accessible, um, travel experience. So it's not going to be, uh, it's accessible to families. And so we don't want to layer too many things into the properties that uh, would lead us to increase rates to cover those things. And so our, our thought with Bluebird is there will be a lot of a la carte options that people can experience and connecting those, like our guests, to local attractions and allowing that to happen in an organic way. We're not, we're, we're not taking a piece of it, but we're really just making the experience happen. One of the things we do or we've tried to do is encourage our guests to experience, to share their experiences along the way um, through, through Instagram or social media, which will then get added to our site, which then encourages people to, to share what their favorite spots along the way are. And we also train our hosts at Bluebird to help with itinerary stops along the way. It's hard a little bit because people are going, you know, on the way from Cape Cod to Hoboken, New Jersey, we don't know all the great spots along the way, but we're willing to help um, research that. So I think the answer to the question is yes. A lot of stuff will be done through packaging and programming and partnership, uh, but not, not necessarily geared toward driving more revenue to the hotel, but really creating more experience for our guests. Awesome. Lots of great stuff here. I know we're coming up at the end of time. We did start a little bit late, so um, I'm going to keep this going for just a few minutes longer. Um, I do want to go uh, give each one of you a chance, a really great question here about features and amenities that campgrounds, RV rental sites, travel platforms, et cetera, are offering to make travel more enticing. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, how to, you know, capitalize on some of the demand and everything like that. So we'll go in order here. Um, John, I'll have you go first. From RV Share's perspective, what are some things that you're looking at to help make the idea of travel and using RV Share for travel more enticing? I mean, the big one is still delivery. It's that's that is the big thing that gets people who were kind of on the bench of traveling in an RV into the game is by putting an RV right next to where they want to be. And that's one we've been, you know, continuing to work on and to refine over time to make delivery as seamless of a process as possible. That involves kind of training our owners to make a, a great delivery such that it's really seamless for the renter. It involves setting expectations for the renter around what, um, you know, what they need to do as a, a temporary tenant of the RV. And it also involves working with campgrounds as partners to make sure the experience is, is seamless for the renter. That's the, the kind of bar we're holding ourselves to is to make it 
as good of an experience as staying in a hotel that you just show up, walk right into to your RV and your vacation begins. So it's, you know, it's one we've been talking about for a couple of years now, but it's it's the big one still. All right, Toby, what about KOA? Some uh, features and amenities that you're looking at to make using a campground uh, more uh, enticing? And well, we definitely see people choose uh, camping based off location first. So first and foremost, we need to make sure there's campgrounds in the locations where people want to be. But while they're there, and in order to make their stay as easy as possible, we're doing a lot of work, you know, beyond, we always have recreation in, in some of those amenities, but we've been doing a lot of work around things people are, are passionate about, like in the sustainability space. And, and uh, where we're talking about keeping connected, you know, I mentioned Wi-Fi earlier, but I wanted to talk about some new things we have like recharge stations, just places they can relax and recharge themselves on the campground, but also plug in their phones. And that's using solar energy. So that's a way we're kind of combining different efforts and things that are important to people and also things that are providing utility. Uh, always increasing our things around glamping options per what we talked about earlier to appeal to more people. But one area, you know, I don't think it's, you know, to use the word mainstream that we've been talking about yet and on everybody's radar, but we're getting in front of is EV. We're working to make sure that those who drive electric vehicles or want to, to buy electric RVs when those are available can charge at campgrounds. I think campgrounds can provide a great solution for charging infrastructure across the country. And we've been working with our campgrounds to try to make that happen and ensure that all of our KOAs have electric vehicle charging stations so that we can accommodate that. Awesome. That's great to know. Alyssa, what about from your perspective, any amenities, features that you're looking at to help um, entice travelers to hip camp? Yeah, well, we talked about our big kind of uh, machine learning initiative around activities and adventures and just the general vibe of places. So that's a big one. Um, but I think the big headline for us would be what we call extras. So this is something we launched um, maybe last year or the year before that gives our host the ability to offer everything from a s'mores kit to a hot breakfast, all the way to like a woodworking class, a farm to table dinner, uh, horseback rides, a CSA box when you check in. And we've seen a really big uptick in that this year, um, outsize first overall, overall growth in the platform. So that's something we're continuing to lean into and encourage people to do. Um, and then building off Toby's point on, on sustainability, another big initiative we launched this year was called Project Monarch. And that was really aimed at finding hosts on the Monarch butterfly migration pathway. Um, we have lost between 95 and 98% of our Monarchs. Um, so they are very threatened right now. Um, and just educating our hosts on how to better take care of their habitat um, to better support those butterflies as they make their epic migration from Mexico to Canada. And um, what we've seen is campers want to camp there more. If they know that a host is doing something like that, um, that's like a reason to go. It's a reason to support them. It helps them understand um, the, the more about the ecosystem they're visiting. So that's something we're going to be continuing to do more and more of. Awesome. And Rob, I'll finish up with you. Um, what are some things that you are looking at with uh, Bluebird by Lark to um, entice travelers to consider your hotels? I am, I'm absolutely going to sound like a broken record here, um, but it is access to experience and access to the community. So people don't come to a hotel, our hotels, just to stay there. They come to travel and adventure around there. And so making meaningful connections and unlocking um, bespoke experiences for our guests, that's, that's our primary focus. And I think that experience-based travel, as we all know, um, is really where it's at right now. People are not traveling just because they're going to a beautiful hotel room or have a beautiful RV. They are traveling because they want to live their lives in a much more meaningful way than I think a lot of us did in our pre-COVID lives. And Alyssa, I love the Monarch thing. I'm going. Let's send the map. Cool. We'll do. There we go. Awesome. Um, well, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, not just our panelists, but everyone who did log in today. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, we could probably talk travel trends for another five hours. Um, but I want to, again, thank all of our panelists, John Gray, CEO of RV Share, Toby O'Rourke, CEO of uh, and President of Campground of America, or KOA, Alyssa Rossio, CEO of HipCamp, and Rob Blood, founder of Bluebird, Bluebird by Lark Hotels. Also, thanks to everyone who attended uh, the great questions that you answered. We appreciate your time. Um, I'm very excited about what's to come in travel in 2023 and beyond. Um, I'm Nick Ewan, Director of Content at The Point Sky. I'm very glad to be a part of this uh, again, and I hope you all have a great rest of the month and a wonderful and restful holiday season. 
Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.